My story is called What It's Like to Play at the Open Mic at the Wild Goose. Every, uh, every Sunday night, rain or shine, all year round, um, I leave my apartment in the railroad district and I bike out to the open mic at the Wild Goose. In my bike rack, I've got my backpack and in my pack is my gig bag and it's got uh, capos and strings and tuners and that kind of stuff. On my back is my guitar case. I have one of those orange and yellow triangle slow moving vehicle signs on there because you are all on your freaking phones. <laughs> and uh, I don't trust you on the road. <laughs> um, sometimes I know what I want to play and sometimes I have no idea. Usually when I'm riding, I'm thinking, um, what do I feel like singing tonight? Uh, what am I in the mood to play? This is very, very different from when I was a younger, more ambitious guy. Uh, then I was thinking, what's my best song? What will get me the most attention? Um, who do I need to impress? Will there be girls there? Will there be the, the person who does the booking or the club owner? It was all about that kind of stuff. The pleasure of singing and hanging out with other musicians, uh, swapping stories and talking shop and stuff was always there but it was always mixed up with uh, uh, ambition and, and, uh, and nervousness, insecurity, competition, trying to impress people. So now I just, uh, I just pedal and I breathe and I think, what do I feel like playing? When I get to the goose, the scene is usually uh, a little chaotic. Jim Quimby will be finishing up his piano set and uh, he's got this loyal group of people that have been coming for years to listen to him and to talk politics. And they're usually in some stage or other of um, clearing out, paying up their checks and stuff. So I, I kind of look around and I notice who's showed up for the open mic. You know, I can see some regulars and some occasionals and maybe some brand new newcomer people. I see uh, Dave Hampton, the host. You know, he'll hopefully back me up on guitar when I play and he'll be setting up the sound equipment and getting the mics ready and stuff. And I'll see Robert Doctor, who's one of my favorite uh, performers. He's a friend and a fellow songwriter. Doctor is really quirky, and he's always full of gentle humor and fun, but sometimes he'll take these just insanely long pauses in the middle of a song. Uh, one time he was gone for a few months, and when he came back, I just said, hey, I just thought that was a longer than usual pause in one of, you <laughs> <laughs> one of your tunes, you know? Um, I see um, Avram and, and Ron, uh, these are two older guys like me, and they like to do covers, and they're always expanding their repertoire. Um, Avram likes to, he likes to cover my songs, which is really a treat. I see Jennifer, who goes by Ifer instead of Jen. Um, she is a weirdly wonderful young woman who I always, always hope will be there. And I might see others too. I might see Jack and Russ, t Poe, Sage, Manny, or Storm and Norman. Uh, it's different every, uh, every Sunday. So every open mic that I've been to since I was a young guy has got their own variation of the list. You know, like, where's the list is something I've heard or said probably thousands of times uh, at open mics. So at the Goose, it's pretty simple. Uh, you just get there and you pick your slot, the one you want that's open, and you sign your name there. Each performer usually gets uh, three songs. So the first open mic I ever went to I was right out of college, I mean right out of high school, um, was a university beer and, uh, beer and uh, pizza place called The Spot in my hometown. And the floor was covered with this uh, weird 70s carpeting that looked sort of like a yellow, orange, black, and brown sort of mosaic mudslide that like came up the stage and went right up onto the stage and went right up the walls, <laughs> right, right up behind the, behind the stage. And uh, their, proce their procedure was similar to the Goose's. You just signed up and did your thing. Um, later in the early 80s, I was in New York, um, you know, trying to do music as a career. And my main focus was always the open mic at Folk City, because this was the famous one. This is where Bob Dylan got discovered, you know. And uh, it was this huge cavernous bar that went really deep in from the street. And they had this weird system where you would put your name in a hat and everyone had to be there at a certain time and they would pull names out of the hat while they took they had a deck of cards that they had shuffled with numbers on them and they'd turn a number and pick a number out of the hat. It's like one through 25. And then when they were done with that, they'd go one through 25B. And then they'd do one through 25C. So it was like 
a, and then they, you would go up 1A, 1B, 1C, 1A, 1 So there was, you know, this open mic went on for seven hours and loads of people wanted to play there and, and, and hopefully get gigs, you know. They had, I think you had eight or 10 minutes and uh, if you were getting close to the end of the 10 minutes, they just flick the lights. You might want to use this bar. They would just flick, <laughs> they just dim the lights a little bit. And then if you kept going and it looked like you weren't going to bring it home in time, they would uh, turn off the lights. And then if you kept going, they would turn off the sound. And if you kept going, they would turn the house music on. And I only saw that once, but one dude just kept right on going 15 minutes, you know, he just went straight through. So, uh, so anyway, I'd go to Folk City and I'd figure out what my number was, you know, what, where am I going up at Folk City? And then I'd hit all the other open mics in the neighborhood in Greenwich Village, you know, and I'd strategize and try to figure out which open mic I would go to so that I, what times, because it's all about times, you don't want to be scheduled at the two open mics at the same time. So you try to make it all work, a lot of strategizing. So um, in, in the mid 80s, after I'd gotten really sick of the music business and eventually just quit music, I moved to Seattle to study uh, and eventually teach uh, Tai Chi. And um, there was a bar on the first floor of the building that I was living in, and they started an open mic for original music only. It was like in my building, right under, my, literally right under my feet. So talk about your, you know, like signs from the universe and whatnot. So, so I, um, I started writing songs again, and I, 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 pretty soon I was in a duo with my friend Victor, and we ended up performing together for ten years, but. I wasn't nearly as ambitious as I'd been in New York, but I still really cared about getting good spots. So I'd always, you know, run downstairs early and try to get a good spot at the at that bar. Um, so these days, I might arrive at the Goose, and the the list is all packed. Uh, maybe one of my buddies signed me up. Maybe they didn't. Maybe the list is really short, and maybe the place is almost empty. It really varies from Sunday to Sunday, but. Uh, that doesn't doesn't really matter much to me. What what matters to me now is making my sound. And that will happen no matter what spot I get. So I'm not immune to applause. <laughs> but uh, that's not why I'm here. You know, I chat with the bartender and the staff, and then I get myself set up. I have my guitar leaning against my table and my pack underneath it, and I have my lyric sheets, and I have my capo and my picks and my tuner and my light and my stuff there, and I have a drink nearby, and I look over my lyric sheets. That's, a th that's what I do at that point, because I want to kind of get a little clearer about what I'm going to play. Now, for some people, open mics are like the lowest rung on the musical ladder. This is the l rung that you want to climb over as soon as possible. You, the last thing you want to be known at is an open micer. But um, for me, open mic at the Goose is kind of like church. I go there every Sunday. Um, it's a place to connect. You know, my words, my thoughts, my feelings, my friends, my guitar, the room, people I don't know, people I know. I come to feel a, a connection to all, all of these things. Music helps me, um, I call it like, it helps me cohere and find a sense of rightness and, and wholeness in my body. Um, playing music helps me do that. It's always done that for me, even though I've had, I don't consider myself talented at all at anything, singing, playing, any of it. It was all hard, and it took years and years and years of persistent work to get even halfway decent at it. But it always helped me do this. It helped me when I was a little kid swinging on the swings and I would be singing to the beat of the swing. And it helped me in high school when my parents got divorced and my dad's alcoholism started to get the best of him. It started helped me as a young guy just kind of sorting out nearly every relationship in my life. And it just helps me sort my life out to play music and, um, and to write music. And sorting my life out is the only thing I've ever really wanted to do. So music really, really, really helps me do that. So even though the Goose is a bar and it's not a solemn or a holy place, it does serve as a container for something that I hold sacred, which is connecting through, through words and, and music. So around 8.30 or so, Dave, the host, he goes up and plays a few songs, and then we go to the list. So this is a bar. So I go in and out of, I go in and out of listening like, like everybody else, but I'm, I'm mostly in. I really do my best. You know, I may be joking with my friends sometimes, and sometimes it gets noisy in there, but I really do my best to listen to each person and see what they're bringing. And there are great musical moments there every single Sunday, year after year. There's always something great. And as I listen, I look around and I see people that 
for, I, I remind me of me at every stage of my musical life. Uh, it's pretty interesting sometimes. Uh, I do listen a lot more now than when I was younger. When I was younger, I would be thinking about myself and my place on the music ladder, and I didn't really listen as much as I do now. So as my spot gets a little closer on the list, I start to focus more and more on my set. You know, it helps me to be a little methodical when I'm getting ready to play. I, I give my lyrics another look and I make my final choices uh, about what to play, take my guitar out of the case and I go to the pool room area and I make sure I'm in tune. Um, one of the worst things you can do at an open mic is just immediately go up and start tuning. <laughs> so as I do each one of these things, I can feel my body sort of like getting ready to play. It's kind of like a pregame ritual like that athletes would go through. I just, I just feel like each step is bringing me closer to to being ready. So I go back to my stage, usually with my guitar kind of over my shoulder like this, and I sit there and I wait around uh, for the last act to finish, and then, then it's my turn. Now the first time I played at the Goose was like 2005 or so. I had decided that I, I needed to make a little more money than, than I was making just from Tai Chi alone. So I made a CD of some of my best songs up to that point, and I sold my first run to my family and my friends. And then I thought, well, I better hit some open mics and see if I can you know, sell a few more. So um, I went in there to the open mic, and I just immediately felt right at home. Uh, little Tom Little was the host at that point. He's since moved away, but he's the best open mics host who ever, ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I liked him. I liked the bar. I liked the people there. I liked everything about it. And it wasn't long before I didn't care at all about selling these CDs. I didn't care about impressing anyone. I just wanted to play. Playing itself just felt really good. And uh, I started to focus on writing songs that made me feel really good. Um, this led to me letting any part of myself that had a song to sing, sing, have a song. So it didn't matter if the songs contradicted each other or had adult language or very adult language or if they were silly or if they fit any commercial category. I didn't care. The only thing that mattered to me and still matters to me is how does it feel to write and play this? If it makes me feel good to write and say this thing out loud, then, then it's a keeper. Um, I, uh, I really, this unleashed a lot of creativity, <laughs> so I started writing a lot of songs. Since I've been in Ashland, I've probably written over 400 songs. I probably recorded maybe 29 albums. I went back to my folk roots and I put it all up on my website free. You can download it all free. Um, and uh, I've never enjoyed playing music more than I have, literally, like right now. Um, I'm not a kid out of high school, all nervous and trying to impress everybody. I'm not a young guy in New York trying to make it big in the music business. I'm not even a Tai Chi student doing this as a serious hobby. This is not my hobby and it's not my career. It's just, just, just my life. So when it's my turn, Dave plugs in his guitar and I plug my guitar in and he adjusts the sound levels and I set up my lyrics with my little book light and and Dave says, uh, as he usually does, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please give a big, big wild goose open mic welcome to Mr. Gene Burnett. And, uh, and I'm on, you know? And uh, usually Dave, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Dave usually has not heard what I'm about to play. Maybe he's heard it once or twice, maybe, maybe never. But he's a good musician, and he listens really, really well. And pretty soon, he'll figure out the chord changes very quickly and add something really nice to the song. Um, I have to say, I, I love the sound that I make. I love the sound that we make when we play together. When everything connects, the lyrics, the message of the song, uh, the guitars, the room, everything, there's, there's just nothing like it. But I, to make this sound, I really have to concentrate on this state that I have to get into in my body. It's not, I have to concentrate on it or it'll just be kind of hollow. So my eyes are closed a lot or I'm just focused on my lyric sheets a little bit. Um, on our best nights, Dave and I just blend really well. Uh, we feel like we're reading each other's minds and, and everything is just, just, I feel like the song is getting what the song needs. Not what I need, it's what the song needs. And uh, you know, other nights, you know, it might be hit and miss. We might have some moments in there, but it, there's always at least some truly joyful moments every time I play and every time we play. They tell me when you do these things, you're supposed to um, 
show, not tell. So I'm going to show you my face now when I think about last Sunday uh, and how great Dave was playing when I was playing my songs. me remembering it, right? So that was me remembering it. I, know, I really did remember it just now. So then my set is done. Now whether people listened or not or liked it or not, if I did it the way that I want to do it, then my whole body just feels like a pile of smiles. And if I get a nice round of applause and if people like it or they tell me something nice about my set afterwards, it's, it's really nice. I really like it. But the main thing is just, did I hit the mark? I'd honestly rather play the song well and look up and see that nobody listened, then play it in a way that feels bad to me and get a standing ovation. Honestly, I just, it's not about that anymore. I like you guys, but I have to please myself first. And that's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm after. So pretty soon my guitar's back in the case, my stuff is put away, you know, I'm ready to hang out and listen to a few more people and um, say my goodbyes and, and hop on my bike and ride, and ride home. Um, I have, a, I have a song here about kind of all of this. Um, it's called uh, Dancing, and um, I'm going to play that for you now once as soon as I just make sure that our guitar is... Can you hear that? All the way in the back? All right. None of us started for money We did it for love and for free Something inside had to get out And it just would not let us be Dancing was easy as walking We could just as soon sing as to breathe We were small and the world was amazing we didn't know thank you from please What happened next is your business It's a story that only you know How the world got replaced by confusion And maps 2,000 years old But there's a fire that's older and deeper and it burns at the center of doubt It'll burn up whatever you want to If you can handle the heat till it's out And we talk a good talk by that fire How we let go and merged with our God But after the talking is over most of us mostly hold on But even the worst have their moments And we all know what they're like The kind you can only look back on Cause you disappeared at the time None of us started for money Though it's part of the picture by now I hope we all will remember Before we take our last bow That dancing is easy as walking We can just as soon sing as to breathe We are small and the world is amazing Even if we know Thank you from please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. I get to unplug.
course, none of that applause mattered to Gene. <laughs> if he didn't feel right, did you feel, how'd you feel? You felt good? Okay, good. Good. He felt good, he said. Yeah. <laughs>